We will talk about uh, some new devices, uh, very early experiences with these new devices because they are very new, uh, especially the first two uh, uh, that we will listen to. So uh, I ask uh, Dr. Tufail Patankar from Leeds. Uh, he will tell us something fr uh, about the UNO device, which is an occlusion device, a vessel occlusion device. And uh, um, after that, uh, he will tell us something about the uh, barrel device, barrel stent, which uh, is a, a supporting device for coil, uh, coiling of aneurysms. Uh, so please, Daniel. Thank you. Um, these are my disclosures. So, parent vessel occlusion, and you, we, we saw some cases yesterday. Um, or particularly the, the vertebral artery and where Prof. More was talking about, and I think somebody asked a question, why don't you use this new device? Um, many of us know some of these devices, the silicon and later, latex balloons is before my times, makes me feel very young, and more, I use you know, detachable coils, pushable coils. There is another uh, device which is the Amplus plug, and some of you might have used it. I haven't used it. There's a paper in AGNR, and that talks about it needs bigger catheters, and it's not licensed above the uh, cranial vessels, and obviously there is surgery. So what is, what is UNO? It's a brief presentation. So UNO is another just a device that can block the vessels, and you can see one of the benefits of UNO is very fast, and it's very quick. It's designed for intracranial users. You can put a catheter, you can put it in, and you can take it out. It's quite resheatable. There are a lot of cases that have been, it's been used in. It's about um, 20 cases since Medtronic has taken it. It was um, being sold by somebody else. Before that, I think there were one 15, 20 cases done before that. So what the device is about, it's uh, basically a very straightforward device. If you look at it, it's got the, the delivery wire, and then you've got this 90 null, um, and then it's, this is the PTFE covers. It's pretty much covered by the PTFE. What's very important to know, it's in two sizes. It's in three and five, as you can see. And for the three, you need a 21 catheter. And for a five, you need a bigger catheter, as you'd expect. So it's 27 catheter. Uh, and it's basically like you're going to push a coil. You can push the device out into the artery. And it's basically designed to occlude an artery. Uh, I'm just going to show you two cases because of time. Uh, this is a very straightforward scalp tumor. Uh, you've got an occipital artery coming in as you can see. And what you would, most of us would do, you'd send some particles, and I put some particles and I've occluded the tumor. And at the end of it, most of us would probably put some coils. You can put a UNO you know, there. And if you put coils, you might have to put a few coils. Here, what I've done here is you can see the markers, uh, and I've just put the device, and you can see the artery is completely occluded. So one device does the job quick and easy, and you finish the artery. I'm going to show you this one, which is quite interesting. Um, this is a partially thrombosymptomatic basilar artery aneurysm, um, which I then put three leos in, uh, long leos across the, the basilar, and then you can see that. And uh, this is the MR, which was done a few weeks after that, a uh, couple of weeks after that, I think. But anyway, the MR shows that you can see there are two lumens now. You can see flow from one side within the stent and outside the stent. And, uh, and I brought him in for an angiogram because I wanted to, um, to block the inflow from one side. Uh, as you can see, the, left, the right vertebral, the left vertebral, and it's filling into it. And that's a bit of delayed pictures. You can see that. And what I've done here is you can see that the device has come in. And you just block the vertebral artery, which you want to block. So effectively, you just, instead of putting coils, I have put a UNO you know, device here. You can see the filling defect. The one of the thing is you don't really see the device except the markers. Some of us like to see it, but it does the job, and it's just closing the artery anyway. And you can see that again. Uh, this is closed. And the right side angiogram fills the aneurysm. I haven't got a follow-up yet, but he's symptomatically pretty good at the moment, so that's pretty interesting. So you know, it's just one of our tools uh, to block the vessels. Good is because it's made for intracranial users. It's three and five millimeters. It's in a micro, standard microcatheter, which all of us are used to, and it's a pretty quick and effective occlusion of the artery. And basically, you can save some coils. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, is there any question or comment? How many people have already used uh, this device in this room? One, two. How many people have used uh, more than five times this device? One. Okay, so the experience is not very high. Um, would you have any tips or tricks to use this device? I've heard in some cases that uh, you don't have an immediate occlusion. So you say it's effective, yes. Uh, but sometimes uh, uh, the occlusion is not as one should have. Is there anything you would suggest in those cases? I think the sizing is very important. Okay. And it's a, you know, if three millimeter is not enough, you've got to move to five millimeter. So personally, if I think I can get a 21 catheter, I prefer to put a 21 catheter because then you know if you don't want to put a three, you can put a five. So that's a good option. If it doesn't close with one, then you probably need to put another one. Uh, that's obviously not the idea because you want to reduce the cost. Uh, if the artery is very big, you might need more or sometimes you just have to put some coils along it. So, Did that happen in your experience or...? or um... Well, I, I saw a case with uh, Chapeau in Jackson Hole. Okay. And that showed occlusion partially, but he had intentionally put a smaller one. Okay. He tried a three, he showed it, and then he put a five, and that also was partially occluding because the basilar was pretty big. So I think you have to be very careful. If it's, more, if it's a six, seven millimeter, you're not going to get immediate occlusion. So you might have to either put two or put some coils. Uh, I've been told also by uh, engineers that it should not also be uh, oversized because if you over, it's like an umbrella. If you oversize it, it will squeeze a little bit, and so the uh, occlusion will will be more. Uh, so the the, the um, uh, PTFE or whatever it is, yeah, <laughs> it I will think... fold, and 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 so not over, not undersized, but not too oversized. If yeah, I and I, I think sometimes when you push it, you know, you kind of have to make sure because it does a little bit of back. It will, and then you just have to make sure it goes. So I think you just have to be careful, just like how you put a coil in. But it does feel like a coil. It doesn't feel very technically, very, very challenging. So it's, it's something that we need because we don't have balloons anymore. More you or don't, less. Need, a, you don't uh, need a proctor for it. Uh, but we, we still have to understand uh, very well uh, how it can work and all the details about it. So thank you very much. We can go to the next presentation, which is about the barrel. Um, so... These are my disclosures, and you can see I'm talking on barrel, but I do, I'm a proctor for web and pulse riders. So I'm not going to talk much because Professor Spell and uh, Professor Morey has already done a lot of introduction to barrel stents. But, you know, again, balloon, I think, you know, if you can get an aneurysm with a balloon, most of us would probably use a balloon. Why is barrel very useful? Um, for, again, we have discussed this morning, wide neck aneurysm. So the challenge now, we are looking at wide neck aneurysms. You know, can you do a balloon or can you put a barrel or do you want to put a web or pulse rider or whatever? So barrel has a distinct advantage um, in what it does across the aneurysm. Um, so if you look at, you know, it's, what's the benefit? Again, it's a 21 catheter. So if you want a six French envoy, you can get your, bar your barrel in as well as your your catheter if you want to jail it, but the company doesn't really like that, and there are some disadvantages of jailing. Um, it's designed to kind of conform to the artery across the bend, so that's very good. What you have to get used to, and when I was introduced first time to the barrel, there were so many markers, and you think, God, how am I going to understand these markers? There are three markers at, the, at one end, three markers here, six markers here, one, one, so quite a few markers, but we're all used to it, and they're pretty easy to see, so it's not uh, technically very challenging. Um, and it is electrically detachable, so that makes it very useful, as many of these things we use now. Uh, this is just from the industry. As you can see here, you've got the markers here, and you can do markers here, which tells you where the barrel is. And that's the main thing. You've got to kind of understand where you're going to put the barrel. So most of the thing, as you saw Professor Spell's case, you know, you've got to find where you want to put a barrel. You want to make sure you get the markers, and they have to be circumferential. Uh, so that kind of helps. So what is a device? Uh, if you look at this device here, and many of us have used Solitaire, and you're used to Solitaire. For me, when I push it in, it feels like a Solitaire. So that's a big advantage. But you've got extra markers here, and you've got the, the distal, the proximal, and then you've got a six markers here and a marker here. So these things, and mainly we are looking at these six markers, 
and you look at this, which needs to be across the neck of the aneurysm. Sizing-wise, is not very tricky. If you look at, we got a 3.5, 4, and a 4.5, and these basically are the sizes which are the proximal uh, diameter. So basically, this is what it tells you. Usually, this one is about 0.5 millimeter less, and then that's the barrel. And the barrel is mainly looking at the span, the bifurcation span, which I'll talk to you in a minute. When you look at the imaging, it's no different. You look at the size, width. What's very important is when you're deciding to put a barrel stand is you look at the bifurcation uh, span length, which is basically the, the, the length which you want to cover across the neck. And I'll come to that in the next slide here. As you can see, this is again from the industry. As you can see the aneurysm, you can see the span. You decide where you want to put a barrel in, and then you decide that's your span length. And then you can choose it, and you decide what your bifurcation span, and then you decide the size, and then you got a, your, and in this case, this is the size they have chosen. This is our case, one of my colleagues did in Preston, and you can see it's a pretty tricky uh, terminal ICH, it's wide neck, um, you have different options now. Uh, they did try different options, and web is also, they do the webs and they do everything, but they didn't think that this was gonna work. They attempted different things. I don't think they attempted web or, uh, or the, but they attempted balloon. And you can see that the MCA is a bit wider, uh, and they wanted to put it across, and that's the span bifurcation span length, as you can see here. Um, and then they identify which vessel you want to go. It's very important to decide which vessel you want to put your, your, your barrel in. And there's a caliber difference, there's an angle difference, and what they've now gone in, you measure the bifurcation span, which is 4.8, and they decide to put it across here. So you measure the ICA, you measure the MCA, and decide what size of the stent you want to put in. And as you can see here, uh, they have chosen the barrel of five millimeter is 4.88, and it might just get pushed a bit, but often it will open pretty okay in that direction. So uh, this is his case, and then you can see that. Uh, that's opened up pretty well. Um, in this case, they've used a, uh, the standard six French, Prowler Plus, headwear. So it's a 21 catheter, already bar 18, what you want to use. Um, and that's the, that's the final result. You can see the six markers here, you can see the distal markers, and then you can go and coil the aneurysm. Um, this is one of my cases. Uh, I did it on a Saturday, and she was a grade one, Sabarak, 40 year old. I had to call the rep um, because I don't have barrel on site and I had to ring him, and he kindly obliged, really, and that was, I'm really grateful for that. Um, and it's a very tiny aneurysm. I was not sure whether I will get this with a balloon. I attempted with a balloon, the coil would just fall out. I then, I tried a number of times, because I didn't want to put a stent unless I have to put a stent. I have other stents available, but I wasn't sure they will work, because this was slightly off-centered. So if you can see that, the 3D, it's really wide neck aneurysm, and then I've just, um, you can see the angiogram, you can barely see that. And uh, what I did was I put a barrel across, and you can see the barrel, and I pushed the barrel a little bit towards it so that it will kind of, initially it was difficult, it wasn't working, but then I managed to just push it. And that's something you can do, like you saw yesterday, what Prof Spell did. You can negotiate the barrel to get in the space and form a neck, and then I put a small coil, two millimeter, uh, there was a bit of a clot, and I had to give some aspirin and reapprove with that, but the aneurysm occluded well, and she did very well, um, and she's been discharged. So this is the one of the last cases I'm going to show you. This is a right MCA incidental aneurysm. In my practice, if you can't coil the aneurysm, clipping is an option, and they would go for clipping first before I start using all my tools. And you can see this. It's a very wide neck aneurysm, and I, it doesn't look very suitable for the other devices that I use, so I decided to put a barrel here. And you can see here, uh, I put a barrel across the neck. You can see the markers here. I have, and then get into the aneurysm. And it's not very difficult to get through the barrel into the aneurysm because the holes are about two millimeters. And then you can get uh, the first framing foil, take a little bit of time like we would do, and then get a frame and then you carry on and you can just coil it. And if you've got a barrel across the neck, you can pretty much get a very good compact um, occlusion of the aneurysm. So you can see that here. And then I keep going on and then finally get a complete occlusion, fill it as much. Because one of the thing is, this is not a flow diverter. You need stent assisted coiling. You need to pack well. And that's what I've done here. 
Um, and the post-treatment, I use the antiplatelets is very standard. They all get one week before, and then they get six weeks afterwards, and then they stay on aspirin. Uh, so barrel is another one of the tools, and you've seen a lot of discussion by the professors here about the benefits of barrel. It's easy to deploy, it's easy to navigate, it doesn't need a proctoring. Uh, you can protect the branch vessel. If you're used to solitaire, you can put a barrel in. And it's another alternative for Y stenting, T stenting, uh, pulse rider, web, so it's just a different tool for us. But again, it's in the vessel, you need antiplatelets, so that's something you need to watch for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, a very new device. Um, any questions or comments from the audience? Yes, there. Have you tried jailing uh, the micro -cassette? Yes, I have. It works. You can jail if you want to. I think what it's a new device, so I think you just have to watch. But there's no reason. We have jail catheters with solitaire before also, and you can go in or you can go around the bend. What they say is that it may have a little bit of difficulty in opening. I don't think so. I think it will open. It's, if, you, if you don't have a good span and you're putting a bigger one, then it's not going to open. A microcatheter cross should not be a problem. So what is your uh, antiplatelet uh, protocol in acute phase? Uh, for uh, the barrel, I give exactly what I used to do when I put solid hairs. Uh, one week of aspirin plavix. I usually give a loading dose a week before. So they get 300, 300 aspirin plavix. And then you get a week of 75 milligrams. And then post, they get uh, six weeks of aspirin plavix. Plavix gets stopped and then you carry on with aspirin. Yeah, but too far, he was asking in acute case. In acute, uh, in that yeah. case, what I did, uh, and I have used uh, solitaires in acute about 15, 20 in the past, now things have changed, but um, in this one, I did not give anything in the beginning, and I could have probably given us some aspirin. Uh, I, was, I was hoping the balloon will do the job, because we really don't want to put anybody on. She was very young, it's a very small aneurysm. I was doing on a Saturday, so uh, what I did was I put the stent in and gave 500 milligram of IV aspirin, and I put a coil in. I did not want to give any aspirin in this case till I have a protection in the aneurysm, because what I didn't want is to give her something, and I wasn't even sure whether I'll get a coil in, and I would have got in trouble. But so more or less. So you I do. give IV aspirin. I, that's what I do. I will put a, usually I'll put a stent in. I'll get some coils in, so I'm comfortable, and then I give IV aspirin. I think my experience with solitaire has been that you can get away with that. Thank you. So you do more or less what you do with the other stents. Correct. Uh, whenever you would use that in an acute. So I, I would ask again the same question. How many people here have already used the barrel? Show of hands. How many have used it more than five times? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Okay, so again, it's a very new device. We still have to learn. Well, uh, you said it's in competition with all the other bifurcation devices we have today. Uh, when would you think it would be more helpful than others, uh, like the web or the... Console? Yeah, I, I think like the case which Prof Spell did, that was not a web case because it just was very unusual. If you got a nipple very at the base of the aneurysm, so my, my ex practice has been is because I have web has come and has got a longer, I use a web. Uh, but like the case with Prof Spell did, for me, that would have been an uh, option between web or a pulsar, because you could have got the neck in, he, he's very good, so he could get a wire in and all. Maybe I would not have got into the 90 degrees, I would have given up a lot earlier. Um, but, um, if, for me, if you, I, the main thing is, do you want to get something in the artery? And if you think that's the reason, some aneurysms are not able to web them, like the one we did. If you've got a very wide neck, where you can't, the size is not correct, then you can get a barrel across. Mm -hmm. I'm, Dali? Yeah. I'm a bit concerned by the, uh, by the design of the, of, the, of the device, and the fact that at the two junctions zone uh, between the normal stent and the barrel, uh, you know, belly of the stent, uh, the, the, it can, in, this can twist, and you, in the first images you show, we see, we see it that's mean, meaning that in the, in the kink, in the, the curves, or if you push too much, these two area can be, you know, squeezed, or, and can, in my opinion, can be within the, within the lumen and not opposed to the wall of the, the artery. Yeah. 
Is it your experience? Or yeah, I think so. I think you're right. I think you just have to be very careful when you are across the bend. And that's why the choosing the right device for the right aneurysm is very important. Because when you place it, sometimes you have to bring it down and you have to make sure you're not pushing it too much. Otherwise, you can get that twisting. And I think that's why it's very important to see the circumferential ring that you see in the barrel. And that's why vas CT can be very useful, but I think you're right. But do you do a, an ex expert CT before coiling? Do you check the position of the, no. of the system? No, I don't even do for other devices also. If you can do, the, do, do that for me, because I would like to know whether at this junction the stent is on the wall of the artery or in the middle of the artery. It's, I'm in Britain. <laughs> Trying to do that is hard work, but yes, we could. Uh, uh, just uh, one comment. The first one is there is no training period. You know, everybody is used to play with stents, so it's easy to use. This is one thing. The second thing is uh, there is a potential effect on wine neck aneurysm, but it has to be proven. So we definitely have a tool that has to be proven to be proven versus one versus the regular coil, so we already know that the regular coil, when you go in a bend, it kinks. Is it kinking when you go through a bend? It might kink. There is some, already some example of a barrel stand that kinks, so you lose the, the belly effect of the barrel. This is another thing that we have to prove. So, honestly, I think, to me, one of the major, uh, I would say, impact of the barrel stent is the fact that you can deploy it completely, keep it attached, and manipulate the barrel during the delivery. That's something that nobody can do with the regular stent that we are using. So basically, with the belly effect, it does compete potentially with the braided stent, Elvis Jr. and Leo Baby. As you will see, tomorrow we'll do a, a case where the, uh, there is a shouldering of the stand that you can deliver in the vessel, and then you displace, modify the positioning of the stand, and then you shoulder the stand over the neck of the aneurysm. So we have to understand that if it's better to do it with braided stand or to use a barrel, understanding that the braided stand doesn't kink, so which is something which is important. But you cannot play with the braided stand when it's delivered. So, you know, honestly, the barrel, as far as you can manipulate it up to the end of the procedure, it's, it's a positive. I, I, I think I didn't mention that, but uh, that's a very, very important point. You can, you don't have to detach, so like other devices, you don't have to detach this. And that's the beauty of a barrel. You don't detach it, you go through the aneurysm, you're very comfortable. It doesn't need a proctoring and then getting people across trying to teach you how to put a Effectively, a solitaire with a barrel in it works pretty good. So I think you can get in, and usually it doesn't move also, which is one of the good things I've found of barrel. But one of the cases I've seen somewhere else, if you don't get the span length right, and you try to put a big barrel in a smaller place, then it's not going to be a barrel. So you just have to make sure you've got the size right. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So now we, we go to the third uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Mario. Mario Galdames on the pipeline flex. How many people have used the pipeline flex in this room? Oh, <laughs> how many more than five times? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mario. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you, Covidian, for the invitation. Uh, for me, this uh, the opportunity to present our experience with the. Uh, Pylon Flex during the last year. As you know, since 2008, um, after uh, the official launching of the Pylon, more than 2,000 patients have done and have been enrolled in the clinical trials and study all over the world. With the first generation Pylon, as you know, they have some technical limitations. Maybe the first limitation was the learning curve. The problems, well, the problems, the complexity of the capture coil for deployment uh, for recapture. You, we couldn't reposition, and we have a distal tip which was had been reported, so distal perforation. So it was a good device with some technical limitations. Since uh, the last year, with the new pylon flex, 
We have the same implant, the same exact stem, the same rate, with a new delivery system, which means, which is based in two Teflon flaps that cover the distal of the stem. There's no capture core anymore. There's no cigar needed anymore. We have a softer distal tip, which is less traumatic. It is resistible and it is more trackable. So we start, and we, we start using this device and we, we report always first cases, mainly based not on a clinical issue, more than a technical report to see how was the technique, which was a little bit di different from the previous generation pipeline. So we, di we discovered, well, well, we realized that uh, after receiving and recapturing the micro, again, the braid uh, opens easier. And as our colleagues, we start being more familiar with the new marks, especially with this one, with the resistor market, which is the no return point. So we didn't ha have, at the moment, the clinical relevance. What was the real learning curve? It's a different technique. It is safe. Does the recapture associate with more complication? Or what about the more immortality? So this is a, a, a nice paper for 2013, the uh, neurosurgery. And they found that during the first 37 patients, they had more complications than with the rest of the, of the, of the group. So we define the first 30 cases as the part of the learning curve. So we enroll all unraptured aneurysms in different locations, for sure, and it was uh, everything in anterior circulation by, by two. Typical location, cavernous paraphthalmic, choroidal pecum, and two posterior circulation. And we, we use the, the routine, as, uh, as everybody used, the anti-aggregation, anti verify now. We didn't have hyper-responders with triaxial system. And this is what we found. This is the technical results. They open 100% instant, fully, fully opening 72%, but in 28% of the cases was a partial opening. So we need to recapture again and resheathing, and they're opening fully. We received almost 50% of the cases, mainly for improved wall position or for opening, and we didn't have uh, other complications. What we have is a slight friction resistance when we recapture the distal tip. The average was 1.3, which is not bad, considering the, the first 30 cases, and this is our clinical results. We have a 6.6 .6, uh, major clinical events related to anterior choroidal infarct in, in, two, the, in two patients where we needed to telescope to, to devices, we didn't have mortality, we have no mineral clinical events, and no thromboembolic events. So considering this part as learning curve, we have the average was less than the, the first experience, and the complication rate was 6.6, which is not bad at all. This is the cases where we have the, the complication, the this dissection in this large aneurysm in anterior cordial territory. The, angiographic, the final angiographic result was not bad, but both patients have the same symptomatic stroke in anterior choroidal. After the analysis, we found that it was not related to the maneuvers. We have here the, the maneuvers in each, uh, in each patient, and in one of the cases, we didn't have any receipts, so it was not related with the maneuvers, but what related be, because of the territory and the fact that we telescope to devices there. So what are our recommendations, our learnings about the technical issue? Here, the Navian, this is what we recommend, at least. Uh, we're positioning the Navian depending on the level of the aneurysm. Where to start unsheathing? The more proximal, theoretically the easier. So we have more proximal aneurysms with support, with enough support, we start deploying at the landing zone. If we have anterior choroidal or pecon aneurysm, we start deploying partially an M1 and then drag it and then continue with the maneuver. This is well, uh, the first recommendation at the beginning was it's not easy to calculate this with the hands, but 80% pulling the micro and 20% pushing the wire. But uh, this is, could be correct and strictly a straight segment, but now we realize that we need at least 40% pushing the wire. I mean, maintain the tension and keep pushing the wire for delivery despite being in a straight segments. This is the maneuver that we told before is a recapture for a fully opening. You see this aneurysm located, and this was the, the first partial opening. It's opening, but after recapture and redeploy it, you see how it opens. 
the maneuvers at the level of the corpse are the same that the first generation pipeline. Once you have the distal end open, you need to keep the micro catheter in the middle of the vessel and start playing with the pull the micro and push in trying to adapt the stain at the outer part of the corpse. Pushing the wire, pulling the micro, pushing, pulling, and, and playing. This is, seems obvious, but this is the most tough part of the uh, pipeline deployment. But when you need to telescope another, another device, you need to be careful about where you start to deploy. If you start in a stretch segment, just uh, further the curve, you may have an in initial partial opening, but if you continue with the same maneuver, keeping the micro in the, in the, in the middle and just pushing the wire, you may have this easier opening. But if you start the maneuver, just in the vertical, in the, in the junction of the curve, you may have a morphology that at the beginning we, you may think that they have a, a malfunction, but it's not. It's, you see here, and it's starting to deploy there. It's partially opening, here is constraint. So you continue, and she think here, and you may find that the stand is going to open first. Here, sorry at the mid portion. So the mid portion opens and the distal end is still flat. This is like a candy shape here. You may think here you need to recapture and try to re redeploy here, but if you continue and shifting and pushing, you may have more uh, a croissant shape here. And at this point, you may think also, I mean, you have here two possibilities try to redeploy, thinking about ballooning, but if you continue, this is a beautiful image because if by continuing Pushing the, pushing the wire and try to open the proximal ends, we are going to see how it opens at the same time the proximal and the distal end. You see here, it is the no return mark. And see both ends open at the same time. So we need to be familiar with, with this type of deployment. I don't think about this is, oh, this is a malfunction of the device and chain and chain and chains. Our distal tip, we can feel any resistance while recapturing, so we recommend to do it in a straight segment. You see it's a small friction. And if you do it on the level of the curve, you may have like this patient, just by pulling back the distal tip, the microcatheter, because of the tension, can jump with no control, so try to avoid at the level of the curves. So what's next? The next step is pylon shield with the shield technology. Uh, you have here engineers who can talk about the, the design, but the thing is this more and more compatible. And theoretically, is the delivery is easier. So this is a recent paper uh, about the measurement of the thrombic generation. They show the, the device is less thrombogenic than comparing with other flow diverter and quite similar to the solitary stand. We have done, until now, nine cases. Six cases were part of the, this, this study, PFLEX study, which is ongoing. And these three cases are uh, out of the study because of the location of the aneurysm. My feeling, only with nine cases, is the delivery is, is better than PyranFlex. The navigability is better, too, which has sense since the hydrophilic uh, coating. And the receiving is this better, too. You see here? How is the navigation? The issue here is the tip of the Maxman located in M2, the tip of the Navian. If you see how this navigation of those, this device, which is a 3.5 by 16, and how is the Maxman is stable at M2? The implant is exactly the same despite the surface. Uh, the technique is exactly the same. You can, may have the same problems where you have a longer devices in a small RGD uh, deliver, uh, deliver at the level of the curve. You may have the same morphology with a, a mid portion opening before the distal end, which technically is the same since it has the, next, the, the same delivery system. And 
it is uh, because of the delivery and the trackability allow us to treat also very distal aneurysm, aneurysms like this, where well, this is a typical case for NSA bifurcation. So my conclusion about uh, our experience with the pylon flex is uh, the pylon flex, uh, the new delivery system is more precise and allow us to make a more controlled deployment. We don't have any complication rate related to the new delivery system. We have the same complication rate that the other flow diverters. We didn't find any problem with the Teflon flaps. With uh, the possibility of the receipt, you know, so, uh, we use less devices, less potential complications. The distal tip is traumatic, and I would like to some message here for take, take on message. Always use triaxial system, which is recommended. The slow deployment is better than fast. After initial recapture, the braid opens easier. Remember the candy croissant morphology during opening on curves? Tip retrieval, try to use in a straight segments. If you feel resistant during the tip retrieval, pull everything out, but gently. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mario. Questions or comments? Nobody. Um, you said that there might be some problems with uh, tip retrieval. No, uh, in fact, uh, uh, never happens anything strange. So uh, the tip retrieval, the fact that once you have deployed the stent, uh, you uh, take the wire off, yeah. and once it ha it tends to enter the microcatheter, of course you have some resistance because you have the two flaps there, but. Never, I've never heard of anything happening there, so it's not a problem. It's really just pull it, up, pull it in, and nothing happens. It tended to give a few advices to do it in a straight segment or things like that. Yes, but it's well, not really a, it's something you are, you have to worry about or not. The, well, the, the case that I showed you before, we we have the um, um, the distal micro at the level of ICA, and because of the tension of the curve, the micro catheter jump with no control to M1 and M2 junction. So it's not an issue, but I think that all the people here or all the operators should recognize that tension. And of if course. you are feeling too much, just pull everything out because if you had an aneurysm in this, in this location, M1 and M2 junction, and they jump, well, there's, a more, there's one more issue uh, with the technique. Okay, and the other thing is about the shield, the technique. Uh, this is um, a very interesting uh, uh, forward going, uh, but still, again, we have to prove that this is where we want to go and this, uh, the results will be like that. Um, I've tried it a few times and I tried to understand if there was a difference. And you said you felt some difference with the normal, let's say, PFLEX. Um, I'm not so sure. I would like to give you a device without telling what it is and tell me afterwards. Maybe it's because it's we one are or the other. Of yeah. Maybe it's the emotion, the emotion to try the new device exactly. like, makes, <laughs> makes more stronger. But it has changed because it's more hydrophilic, so theoretically it could navigate easier through the part you say. That you did, right. you, we need more numbers we need more and numbers. we need more experience. But thank you very much, Mario. And thank you, thank you for Covidian for this uh, very nice symposium.